Welcome everybody out there in radio land uh, to the final panel of what I'm going to call Virtual Vienna, uh, the 26th, I think, annual Euromoney Global Capital Central and Eastern European Conference. Uh, the first 25 did take place in Vienna, uh, and Victor, I'm sure we shall all be back there. Um, and on that note, uh, I'm going to ask the five distinguished economists assembled um, when they think the recovery, if recovery there be, might take hold. But first of all, let me introduce them. Um, the panel is called Back to Normality, which kind of begs the question in itself. Um, but as is traditional at this conference, we do have as this final session a group of economists. Uh, some of them have, have um, long standing uh, members of this panel, and uh, some are new. So let me quickly introduce them. Uh, you'll have to sort of, uh, uh, I'm sure they'll wave their hand when, uh, when their name is, is called out. Um, Peter Brzezinszczek uh, is Chief Analyst at Raiffeisen Bank International. Obviously, this conference normally is next door to their building, uh, where they usually invite us for a beer and a sausage afterwards. Um, great to have you back, Peter. Uh, Gilles Moek is with us. Uh, he is Chief Economist and Head of Research at AXA Investment Management, uh, based in London, but at the moment he's in his native land uh, in the south of France. He's speaking, speaking to us from there. You can see the sunshine in the background. Um, Anne Pettifor is joining us from her house in, in rural Suffolk in England and is the Director of Policy Research in Macroeconomics at a uh, think tank called Prime Economics. Um, Deborah Revoltella is with us from Luxembourg. She's the Director of the Economics Department of the European Investment Bank. Um, and Azad Zangana is Senior European Economist and Strategist at Schroeder's Investment Management. And he's very easy to spot because it says Schroeder's about 15 times behind him. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Azad, because um, we're going to start with the, uh, I know you're a senior European economist, but I'm going to ask you a global question. Uh, and then we'll drill down as we go through our cohort of economists uh, to find out what they think more about Europe and indeed about Central and Eastern Europe. Um, but let's get right into this. Um, what shape is economic recovery going to be? And when are we going to get it? As a well, thank you, Christopher. Um, it looks like we've seen quite a large part of the recovery uh, coming through already, uh, although certainly for Europe, uh, we're having a setback uh, this winter as cases uh, and certainly deaths associated with the pandemic have spiked uh, once again. Um, I think a lot of the um, question can be answered uh, by thinking about how quickly we can get treatment and the vaccines out distributed and so that we can get to a sort of a um, herd immunization sort of situation. Now, um, the UK, Israel, even the US are quite a bit ahead of the game uh, from mainland Europe. Um, hopefully, uh, in the second half of this year, we will start to see uh, normality return to everyday life. But it may be that um, it takes until next year before we see other parts of the world, including emerging markets, catch up. Um, so travel restrictions may be in place for some time. But the economic recovery, I think, especially for developed world, uh, looks is looking good for the second half of this year. And, well, there was a lot of talk last year about different letters of the alphabet that would describe this economic recovery, Vs and Us and Ws and even K, I saw. I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, but what shape is it going to be? Well, it already looks like a, a bit of a W. It may be a WWW uh, in uh, sort of trend with digitization um, because we will have quite a bit of stop start, uh, I'm afraid. it's We've we've seen that the only really effective way of bringing case numbers down and deaths down is, is through lockup and uh, through restrictions on people's freedoms. But unfortunately, that, with that comes the economic cost from that disruption. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's what one could actually call uh, scientifically proven thesis, but you've majored, majored very much in your comment on vaccines. Um, Gilles, I'm going to turn to you and ask you, uh, give us your view on, on recovery timing and shape. But also, I mean, six months ago, nobody really expected a vaccine or any, any vaccine to be ready by now. We were told it could take years and years. 
And yet people were still talking about V-shaped recoveries then. Uh, and you saw a bit of that in some places over the summer. Um, of course, what really happened was that the weather got better and viruses don't like warm weather. Um, but is, do you major, as Azad does, on the impact of a virus as a determinant of economic recovery? Oh, well, back, yeah, no, pardon. I keep, using, yeah. keep using two words beginning with V and interchanging. Yes, the vaccine. Yes. Um... Actually, what I have in mind in terms of, of shape of, of the recovery is is probably close to, to the Greek letter mu, if you want, where you know, the first wave was absolutely catastrophic. Uh, economic activity collapsed. Then we had a sort of uh, mechanical rebound in Q3 of 2020. And now we are faced uh, with uh, another, another very bad moment, another relapse in, in the pandemic. But what is interesting is that uh, the depth of the activity retrenchment is much shallower than the first time. You know, for instance, the construction sector completely stopped during the first wave, didn't stop this time. Um, you have a number of companies which are you know, better equipped basically to, 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 to deal with the restrictions. So uh, for me, it's, it's a mu with or a weird W where the second leg of the W uh, is, is shallower than, than the first. Now, is the vaccine the solution to all this? Yes, because um, the issue we have, I think, uh, when it comes to investment in particular, is to have some sort of visibility, not just over the next three months, but over the next three years. And I think the corporate sector in general globally needs to be fairly convinced that we're going to be COVID free at some point, probably towards the second half of 2021, before making big decisions uh, on, on CapEx. And it's definitely CapEx, which I think is going to be the determinant of uh, the strength of, of the recovery. Consumption will rebound. It always does. You know, when you go from uh, forced uh, uh, saving uh, and then you liberate the capacity to spend, consumption will recover. But the key is investment, and for investment to restart, we need a COVID-free well. I must thank you for uh, for bringing us the Greek alphabet. Um, I don't know if Anne is going to start talking about Sanskrit characters or something. Like that. Mu, if, if I had the ability to share a screen, we could draw a mu. Uh, luckily it's not upsilon. Anne, we'll bring you in here. Uh, Given you're, you're obviously not a, a financial sector economist in the same way as all of these other people are, so I suspect you may have a slightly different perspective. But what is your prediction for global economic recovery? Well, I, I think, thank you very much, Christopher. I think very much it's going to be a K-shaped recovery. As we see from uh, the latest uh, data out of the US, the, the unemployment amongst the top decile uh, uh, of employed people in uh, the United States is only 5%. In the bottom deciles, it's it's 20%. And so what we're going to see is an awful lot of unemployment and an awful lot of unemployment amongst low-income people. And that, that imbalance, that's why those in the top deciles are going to do very well out of the recovery and are going to recover quickly and indeed are already recovering. But if I can interrupt you just, just for a second now, I beg your pardon, but I just want you to tell us Tell us how the K-shape works, because I can't quite visualise that. The K-shape works by, by, by the upper arm saying, yes, there's going to be a recovery for those, for the top 5%. But for the bottom 5%, the recovery is going to be much slower and much more painful. There's going to be high levels of unemployment. And, you know, that, imply, that applies here in the UK. It applies in Europe and, it'll apply, and it applies, of course, in the United States. So... So, you know, I'm, I'm less optimistic about the recovery because I think the global economy is deeply scarred by this pandemic, but also by existing uh, imbalances across the system. Okay, well, we have that K shape. Um, uh, uh, Deborah, let's look specifically at Europe. Um, and Anna's, Anna's given us the uh, startling revelation that poor people are worse off than rich people. Uh, so thank you for that. But, um, Deborah, specifically in a European context, what shape recovery and when? You can use a letter if you want to, but you don't have to. I, I, I actually uh, subscribe to both the view and the K. So I buy the two principles also for Europe. 
But I also wanted to add another thing, and they go out uh, from uh, from uh, letters, and they steal it uh, from Eric Nielsen, actually from Unicredit, uh, that uh, started uh, talking about uh, quite early uh, in time about uh, this uh, Nike logo shape recovery. I think it's called a SWOT recovery, and then uh, you really go down fast, and then it takes a long, long time uh, before you go back. And I think it is a long, long time before you go back. It's definitely coming from the pandemic effect. So, and I agree with Sujil that before COVID is under control, we will continuously have various shock and various uncertainty. Uncertainty will dominate and will continue to dominate behavior of agents. But it's not only that what worries me, the second element that worries me on the recovery part is related to the, um, let's, see, let's call it the second round effect of the crisis. So far, we have seen a massive policy response that has been really supporting the recovery and keeping everything alive for the moment in which demand will restart and then you will be able to, to restart much faster. The problem is that a lot of the policy that has been put in place was designed to be a uh, addressing a, a short-term problem, a problem for a six months, a few months, etc. And now it's a prolonging. So how this policy have to change in order to adapt to the changing path is something important. And what I'm mostly worried of is that uh, we start seeing sign of uh, debt issues, uh, not on sovereign, uh, because uh, this uh, seems to be relatively under control, uh, but more on the corporate side uh, that uh, sooner or later will come. So if I summarize, uh, I see this as water recovery. If you want a, a, logo Nike, a logo of Nike, if you want to think about it, and the, and the reasoning behind is really part is the uncertainty, part is uh, the long lasting scar out of the crisis uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, are there and that uh, are materializing. And how the policy response we react to those is still, uh, is still, still to be seen and uh, how much of flexibility there will be to deal with that. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Peter, I remember chairing a discussion in June uh, with a bunch of finance ministry officials and indeed with, 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 one, with one of your colleagues, uh, with Yenna, um, finance ministry officials from across the region. And back then, they were pretty um, sanguine. They, they, you know, some countries were still predicting there would be positive economic growth this year. Um, the countries we had were Uzbekistan, Ukraine, Lithuania, Slovenia, um, I forget which other, I'm sorry, but anyway, it was a cross-section of countries from uh, CEE, broadly defined. That picture has changed quite considerably, I would say, in the second half of 2020. Tell us what you think specifically from a CEE perspective is going to happen in terms of economic recovery. Obviously, some countries are dominated by manufacturing, some countries much more reliant on tourism or indeed um, remittances and so on. Uh, but give us a, a sketch across the region of how you think recovery will, will get underway. Well, thank you. Yeah, basically the CE recovery doesn't look like a heterogeneous development, although we assume different timing of lifting the restrictions uh, during the first half of uh, 2021 in the respective countries. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at the Oxford stringency index, you know, which measures the business restrictions, uh, we have uh, different um, situations. Uh, the Central European countries are currently uh, with the most severe lockdowns measures implemented. Uh, we have rising restrictions uh, in the Balkans uh, and relatively open economies in Russia and Ukraine. But even the different infection rate cycle uh, are not automatically coincident uh, with a different GDP growth figure. So one can say it deeper, uh, the deeper the, and longer the recession, the quicker, the stronger the respective rebound is expected. And we have experienced that from the second to the third quarter uh, last year. And apart from the structural difference, 
uh, in the recent development of mobility indicators uh, and energy uses, uh, usage, we have uh, a similar uh, development in the pertinent countries, surprisingly. So, in total for 21, our annual GDP numbers are more or less similar in a projected range between three and a half and five percent uh, increase versus 2020. Um, and that's in line with uh, the global consensus view. Uh, only in the Czech Republic, we feel a little bit more cautious. Uh, and uh, the more coherent upward trend is uh, the similarity in the policy mix between fiscal and monetary impulses we see across the region. And uh, therefore, it's surprising that uh, all we have a varying uh, supply side uh, GDP uh, development in uh, countries with manufacturing automotive sector driven economies and sector driven dominated economies and also export driven economies. Um, we have a more similar overall growth for 2021 and even for 2022 expected. You mentioned um, monetary policy across the region because I, I chaired earlier on a panel with, uh, with some central bank governors. And for example, the, the governor of the Central Bank of Albania uh, was talking about uh, modern monetary theory uh, and was talking about the new low rates that they have in, in Albania. Um, and, you know, he was suggesting that QE, he did not say that Albania was going to go into a QE program, um, but it was clearly an implication that as rates go that low, monetary policy toolkits become exhausted or, or perhaps not exhausted, but, uh, you know, you can't go much lower, um, then QE is next. Um, and that's quite an interesting development in our region. <clears throat> is that, that's addressed to me, is it? Yes, the problem is that we can't rely on monetary policy alone. And, and part of the, and you may dismiss um, the, 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 the K shape, you may dismiss the, the levels of inequality, but it's precisely because of the dominance of monetary policy that we have these levels of inequality. And that, I mean, for example, we, you know, this is the day after the president of the United States uh, has been impeached for a second time. I mean, part of my, my, my issue is that the, the dominance of monetary policy and the, the imbalances that has wrought by inflating asset prices and, and, and also uh, general conditions uh, restraining real wages, uh, you're, you've got these tensions and you've got these uh, divides, uh, and this inequality, which is causing, you know, if you like, political upheaval, and those are acting as barriers uh, to the recovery, in my view, and will act as barriers to the recovery. We're seeing, if you like, uh, the rise of uh, protectionism. It, it's certainly, certainly, it, it's certainly United States, most importantly in China. So, you know, the, what China is going to do and what impact that has on both the European and the Central European economies, I think is a matter of, of great importance to us. Well, it's, it's certainly true that monetary policy has brought us to a stage where, as you say, financial assets are trading at vastly inflated prices. Um, but the, the inevitable question that anybody's going to ask is, what would you actually do about it? Because if you started uh, reversing the monetary policy moves of the last 12 years, uh, you would very quickly have some fairly major crises. But I, I, if, if I may, I, I don't really want to go into that particular debate at the moment, but I do want to stay with you, Anne, because debt is one of your things. Um, when we started this panel a year ago, as some of you will remember, um, my first question was, um, are we going to have a debt crisis in 2020? Um, now, we didn't have a debt crisis in 2020. We had a rather different kind of crisis. But one of the results of that crisis that we have had has obviously been the creation of unimaginable levels of new indebtedness um, across the board. I'm thinking of sovereign indebtedness, but obviously debt of many, many kinds. Um, so how is that going to play out? And if, if you could give us your view on how it plays out specifically yeah. in Central and Eastern Europe, that would be good. But I'll ask all the others as well. So just a quick answer on that, if you would. 
it's it's not easy to give a quick answer, but but uh, you're quite right. You know, global debt is 365 percent of GDP. It is not going to be repaid ultimately all of that debt. But the big worry is corporate debt. Now, there's several ways in which we can deal with corporate debt. We could write it off we could, and cancel it. Uh, we could uh, extend it. Uh, we could, um, you know, there are different ways of dealing with it. The very best way of dealing with it would be to generate the income that enables those debts to be repaid. But that requires what we were discussing earlier is for there to be stronger fiscal policy to uh, stimulate investment uh, both in the public and the private sectors to to lift us out of this deflationary era that we've been in since the global financial crisis. You know, we need to raise the level of incomes across the board, not just for the top 5%, but for the rest. Um, and that that that's really important for corporations that actually have built up these large volumes of debt, because, thanks to uh, QE and, and uh, accommodative, uh, mon accommodative a monetary policy, but now need to earn the money, the income needed to repay those debts. For me, that would be the best way of dealing with it. <clears throat> the other way is default cancellation, and all of those are, are very damaging, uh, ultimately. Um, but I can't see policy makers, and I think Deborah makes an important point here. I can't, I see there's an enormous U-turn, a screeching U-turn, by the IMF, the OECD, and today by the Financial Times on the question of the use of fiscal policy. But I'm not sure whether or not that, that response, that policy response is going to take place with a degree of urgency that Deborah uh, suggests is needed to ensure uh, 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 something more than just a Nike-shaped recovery. Gio, can I ask you to respond to, to what you've been hearing, um, but also if you could, to just tell us where does all it obviously ends up in portfolios managed by your colleagues at AXA, but you know what I mean? Sorry, it, it froze for a bit and I missed the beginning of your second point. I was just saying, where does, where does this massive inflation of, I mean inflation in the sense of something growing, uh, this massive stock of debt end up yeah, um, one on 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 corporate debt. Um, I, I would introduce a small nuance there, in the sense that yes, it's an issue. Yes, the levels are uncomfortable, but in many many cases, uh, what's interesting is that most of this increase in corporate debt has been used to uh, build equity buffers. So when you look at the net debt point, uh, 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 metric, actually for a lot of corporates, the situation is actually not that much worse than what it was before the pandemic. Obviously, it would become really problematic if uh, the crisis lasts for too long so that those liquidity buffers uh, get uh, completely uh, uh, absorbed. But for now, um, just introducing this nuance, uh, we have a little bit of, of time or uh, a bit more capacity than usual to deal with, with this with this debt beyond the fact that obviously most of this debt has been issued at an extremely low uh, uh, interest rate. Now, where I agree with Anne is uh, on the idea that uh, partly because of the level of corporate debt, it's going to be very hard to count on the massive rebound in uh, private investment, uh, which I was describing in my in my first uh, 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 intervention. Um, I don't think the corporations will be ready very quickly to invest as much as that they would have done before the pandemic. And that clearly opens the door to some sort of uh, substitution. One of the reasons we need public investment is precisely because we need to offset what is likely to be a uh, 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 missing uh, 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 private investment in the next two, two to three years. Um, but I'd be probably a bit more optimistic than Anne on the prospects of seeing this done with a, a matter of, of urgency. It's my last, last point. Um, Biden's platform is extremely spendthrift. Uh, I think we're going to uh, hear more uh, about this in the next in the next few hours. I think the U.S. policy stance is to some extent going to have a sort of traction effect for the rest of of the developed economies in Europe. I can't help but noticing, I know it's for later in our conversation, but I can't help but noticing that Germany, for instance, has finally accepted the principle of deputization to fund 
an, uh, a mutualized investment effort, especially uh, a green investment. So I'm actually I'm actually quite optimistic about this sort of shift in pendulum, if you want, in the way governments uh, think about public investment. Let's stop here. And, and do, everybody, everybody wants to come in on this topic. So, Deborah, you're first. Yes. Can I can I enter in the topic? And I also wanted to to bring uh, some uh, some nuance uh, on this. I think. Uh, um, I think uh, when we look at uh, the situation of firms, uh, we, we, we just uh, run a survey that is covering uh, 12,000 uh, firms in Europe. It's a representative for all countries. So it's quite a, quite a, give a, quite a, some understanding on the impact of the crisis on firms. And also, we have been doing a lot of analysis on balance sheet of uh, the firms, simulating uh, the dynamic uh, going forward. What we find out uh, is uh, from the survey we see, we ask uh, firms uh, what we asked uh, during the summer. So it was already a big part of uh, the, the, the first part of the COVID crisis was in. We asked uh, to the firm uh, what is uh, their immediate impact on investment, the, uh, the immediate impact of COVID on investment. And 45% uh, of firms, uh, both in Europe and in Central Eastern Europe, uh, they say that we are going to reduce investment fast because of the crisis, because of uh, what is happening. And this was uh, quite clearly coming because the revenues were decreasing, costs were not adjustable completely, even if a part of the cost was adjustable because of the policy intervention, and particularly the social insurance schemes have been very effective on that point of view. But at the end, the firms, the first thing that they tried to do was uh, reduce investment. But then if you ask them, what do you think COVID will bring in the medium to long term, uh, you have a, a very high number of firms, 50% so telling us that we will have to invest more to adapt to the new normal in digitalization. 40% say that we, we will have to invest more to innovate, to transform our product and services in order to be competitive in a post-COVID world. So the question is really, how do you navigate from decreasing investment today to um, doing this investment and its investment in digitalization, in innovation? You can add also the climate component there, which is needed for the long term. And then the question mark comes from what is happening to leverage. And here uh, I correct a little bit what I was saying before. Um, I think the policy intervention has been fantastic in the first phase of the crisis. It has kept liquidity open, the credit channel open to firms. So it's not only that, it's supported in many ways, but basically has managed to keep firms alive during the crisis in this period of time. The problem is that if it lasts much longer, for now, what the firms have is access to credit, access to liquidity. If it lasts much longer, this will not be enough. You will need to add other form of, uh, of uh, um, support to the firms that go more on access to product related to equity, equity out of product. Otherwise, we will have an issue of leverage that will constrain the recovery. So my point is, uh, is really we need to, to let uh, firms prepare for the new normal to invest in digitalization and innovation and start doing it now because they have to do it for the new, for the new phase. And uh, only instruments that allow them to have liquidity and credit will not be enough if we look at a one year horizont from now you will have to have something else more on the equity equity side of product going on. I think there are some, some, some optimistic things to be picked out of what you just said. But Peter, you wanted to come in on this topic. Please, please give us your comment. Yes, I, I would bring another aspect into this discussion, which is uh, uh, the um, the public debt uh, and um, uh, CE in general, and I uh, disagree with Anne, uh, is much better positioned than other uh, regions uh, like the Euro area or the US. Um, 
because when they're going into a new crisis, when you contain the, the, the debt levels uh, before the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, and the prior uh, COVID-19 debt levels, you see uh, a strong increase of uh, the euro area and the US uh, uh, entering uh, the new crisis, and they are moving uh, more and more on the upside. And uh, the more they are on the upside, uh, the less they are uh, 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 taking uh, the challenges uh, properly, uh, because then uh, at the end they have to raise the taxes. Uh, looking into the future of uh, CE and Southeastern European uh, countries, they have uh, really sound debt levels, even in the COVID-19 um, pre-crisis area, only 48% in Central Europe, only 40% in Southeastern Europe, compared to um, 84 in, in the Euro area and 106 in the US. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, shows that even then uh, you have uh, a much better uh, position uh, to come out uh, with uh, relying on nominal growth, growth tend to impose some severe uh, structural um, tax uh, hikes uh, and 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 other um, other measures and instruments which are then preventing uh, the corporates from investment and uh, therefore i think the environment in central europe is much better because we have a relatively flexible labor market in the sea we have less bureaucracy well, so the supply side measures can boost the e uh, economic growth in the next couple of, uh, of years more noteworthy than in uh, other regions where we have a lot of uh, restrictions, regulations. And uh, I think uh, that's also a very good aspect uh, then to promote and to boost uh, private investment into that area, what has uh, Deborah mentioned, the digitalization, the climate change and so on and so forth. Can I just say um, that I quite, I mean, I take Peter's point and he clearly knows and understands the region far better than I do. But, but, but I think what I'm trying to say, and I, I agree that yes, clearly the central uh, European economies are better placed than many European and, 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 and Anglo-American economies are. But I also discovered to my surprise the dependency of the central European economies on, for example, trade with uh, the United Kingdom and and London in particular, and the, the the degree in which there is you know sharing, if you like, of technology, sharing of opportunities between the two uh, two countries is now closed down by Brexit. My point is that you know politics enters into the frame here. Politics enters into the frame to make it harder for countries to compete, uh, makes it difficult because of the barriers that are being raised. Um, and so while central, the central European economies might be able to manage their own domestic sovereign debt, the question is whether they can carry on trading in the way they were doing before in, and, and in a way that stimulated those economies. So that, that's my anxiety, Peter. Uh, may I respond to that? Uh, because uh, the car yeah, just only the calm reaction and the relatively stable financial markets during this COVID-19 crisis in Central Eastern Europe demonstrated apparently that very low uh, entry debt levels are a, a very good environment and a framework uh, to keep this low interest rate environment also without any infusion of uh, external financial means um, and uh, keep the, the economy running. So I think I think um, uh, these are the prerequisites which are, which are necessary uh, to prevail and uh, to start the recovery more smoothly. It's, it's also fair to say that there is an argument which has been given a lot that, um, if you like, the more emerging and emerging market is, uh, the more used to crises they are, uh, and therefore the more nimble they are able to be in terms of responding to it. But. Um, As I, you, you wanted to talk about this, this debt question, but as, as Anne has, has raised the question of Brexit, um, you should probably give us a word on that. I'm not sure that Brexit, why Brexit would have an impact on non-EU countries' trade with the UK, uh, but Anne suggests it would. But um, if you could tell us 
First of all, your comment on debt. Secondly, are there particular effects to CEE uh, of Brexit? Thank you. Well, well, I'll start on the debt point, and uh, Peter makes an excellent point about the, the low starting levels uh, of debt. Um, in, in actual fact, what's been quite interesting is the introduction of QE amongst other emerging markets around the world has now improved the tolerance for investors like us to look at um, rising debt levels in emerging markets. And I think I think that is actually a bit of a game changer. And if suddenly we started seeing uh, more of these uh, um, countries starting to introduce QE, um, you know, we won't be thinking about a collapsing currency anymore. We, we will genuinely still be considering purchasing that debt. So the tolerance levels have certainly um, improved. Um, also, what I where I find myself quite optimistic about uh, the CEE region, and, and I'd also include with that the, the large uh, EU Eastern European uh, bloc, is that the growth dynamics do look far better than uh, the developed part of Europe. Um, I do expect inflation to eventually come back. I, I do eventually expect central banks to look to raise interest rates to combat that inflation. And I think that in itself is going to be very powerful in terms of making sure capital is moving in the right places of the economy, going towards uh, the companies that are most efficient, helping to boost productivity over the medium term. Whereas I'm, I'm quite concerned about the future for old Europe, if you like, where interest rates are likely to remain negative probably for maybe even the next decade or so in order to help aid fiscal policy absorb the extra debt that's been accumulated. And with that comes the misallocation of capital and the low productivity rate for, for many years uh, to come. And then touching on uh, the Brexit question, um, there's always associated trade uh, that goes on, sort of third parties um, trading and, and outsourcing. So you do see a lot of trade. I mean, you mentioned technology, for example. There's a lot that goes on between the UK and Poland. Um, and I assume some of that then also filters down into uh, other countries outside of the EU um, as well. Um, migration issues, I think, are going to be quite important. Um, Making life more difficult for students to come to the UK to study will also have a long term negative impact uh, on, on productivity for those sectors, uh, not only for the EU, but across uh, across Europe uh, more, more generally. So the, these do have uh, implications long term. But over time, um, I do believe that people will find ways around them. Um, you know, we, we've seen that technology companies are very good at becoming global players, uh, having entities across uh, borders, across barriers. Um, and, and I can see that there is scope for that uh, to happen as well, be it Brexit or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azad. Um, Christopher, can I ask? And, 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 and I'm sorry, but we, we've got seven minutes left and an awful lot of topics to discuss. So we can't come back to each other on, on every single topic. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Deborah, can I turn to you? And the, the point that we discussed a little bit before about the political timetable in Europe, there's, there's quite a lot of political stuff going on in, well, in the EU um, this year. Um, <laughs> Portugal and Holland are not headline grabbers, but they're happening soon. Both of them are pretty predictable, the results, I think. But the focus obviously is on what happens to Germany post Merkel. Uh, and then looking forward, not very much further beyond that, uh, what happens in France in the presidential election? Now, I, I know these are your shareholders, but I'd be interested just from your point of view, if you could give us a bit of a word on where you think this is taking us. You muted yourself deliberately. Okay. <laughs> I was I was you. muted by <laughs> no, I was saying that I take my Italian hat and uh, the reading of newspapers today is, and I say that uh, if I'm worried of something on the political point of view uh, for Europe in this moment uh, is more what I read about uh, concerning Italy because I think uh, that's uh, that's really we we have uh, find that at the European level a way which the policy response uh, with uh, with many difficulties is uh, 
kind of cohesive around the, the same problem, and the same problem is uh, fighting against COVID and uh, passing uh, the crisis. And there is a, we have seen in the last, uh, in the last uh, months, uh, quite some, uh, at the end, uh, we get out uh, to ex exceptional, extraordinary package before the summer at the mm -hmm. European level coming. And uh, we see that uh, with uh, all the complexity of the European uh, negotiation, we come uh, to this. But uh, this comes also with uh, confidence among countries on the economic development. And I think that the fragility of the Italian government in this moment can be, can be challenging, if you want. So I think that Italy really has to come with a strong, strong message. That's a personal view, it's not an institutional view, clearly. But I think that if we think at a political tension in members in a single country. So we have to look at the Italian situation and hope that there are many ways in which this can unsolve in different way, in a very calm way. And I think that showing the stability is something quite important. That's on the political point of view. I think it's, uh, it's uh, what we should continue to look at. Thank you. We, we don't have a German. Um, we have a, the next best thing in the shape of an Austrian. Uh, but we do have a Frenchman, <laughs> so, uh, sorry, that's, that's the other way around really, Peter. Um, we do have a Frenchman, you have a vote in next year's presidential election. Um, I mean, clearly, what is going to happen in German politics, what is going to happen in French politics, could be quite dramatically different from what we've been used to over a considerable period of time. How do you see that playing out? Gilles? Um... In the case of in the case of Germany, obviously, I'm I'm following uh, the sort of, of primary within CDU with, with with quite some interest. But uh, uh, at the risk of being a bit dull, uh, my impression is that German politics move in small steps. So even if obviously there is a, a, a measure of concern with uh, Angela Merkel leaving. Probably because we, in a way, we're so used to her, and we're so used to her uh, uh, form of, of leadership. There's a bit of nervousness around who is going to, to replace her. But uh, I see German politics and the German approach to Europe uh, actually quite stable over the last the last decades. And uh, obviously, Angela Merkel pushed things very far, especially in this current crisis with this acceptance of, of deputization. Um, but I'm not, I'm not too worried about this. And in the case of, of France, you know, we don't like to do what everyone is, is expecting us to do, sometimes with quite a bit of schadenfreude. So in 2017, I was inundated with questions about, oh, for sure, France is going to move uh, to the, the populist uh, uh, inferno. And actually, we elected uh, uh, the most market-friendly centrist candidate you could think of. Um, Obviously, uh, Emmanuel Macron has, 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 has had you know, tough years. Uh, the pandemic is an issue. Before the pandemic, we had social protests. But what I find interesting in the French case is that um, the populists did not gain that much, actually, through this crisis. I mean, it's early days. We will have to see where we are next year. Uh, but and I would I would draw a parallel with with Italy actually yes the current situation is a bit concerning and I'm following this very closely as well uh, but it's not as if the populists have, have had a very good crisis either um, so you know, I I remain fairly fairly optimistic okay well that's 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 good I guess um, social democratic policies continue um, Peter does it feel like that from Vienna you're you're sitting there in the frugal four. Uh, we touched on um, debt mutualization uh, in, in the Eurozone. Um, maybe we should close by having a couple of more words about that. What do you think about what you just said, Peter? Um, what I would like to, to add to this discussion uh, probably is um, that um, Europe's future might be decided in the next uh, two days uh, at the Christian Democratic Union virtual party congress uh, when they are deciding on the success of uh, Mrs. Merkel. And um, it's uh, a clear distinction, uh, I'm definitely convinced, uh, between Mr. Merz and uh, the two other candidates. And uh, uh, on the one hand, you might have an explicit advocate for market uh, economic oriented solutions. 
and uh, a balanced way on e ecological and economic requirements. And uh, the other two guys are more state oriented and uh, maybe uh, uh, prolongate, uh, uh, pro uh, prolongate uh, the Merkel style policy, which is uh, in my, uh, in my uh, consideration far away from a reform dedicated po economic policy. So I think it will be a very interesting uh, decision what happens uh, in, at the weekend on Saturday um, at this uh, virtual meeting. So you, and you then it uh, depends on. You, you don't show the view that it's going to be business as normal. Uh, no, I think uh, because um, if it is Merz, for example, uh, a deeper fiscal union in the euro area under Chancellor Merz is highly unlikely. If you have the other two uh, persons, Laschet or Röttgen, I think uh, it can be a continuation of uh, what Mrs. Merkel has uh, initiated with uh, the macro merkel Pact last year. And do you see fiscal fiscal union as a real prospect? We've got a couple of minutes left, and I'm going to ask each of you one question after this. But tell us what you think about fiscal union. Well, I, I wanted to come back to the question of inflation, really, because I, I disagree. Well, if you wouldn't mind, if we could, if we could stay on topic, I, I'd greatly yeah, appreciate you know, it. I, I want to link that. I mean, the fact is that the very low levels of inflation and the very low levels of interest inside the European Union are a function not of monetary policy decision making, but of the weakness of those recoveries. And so long as those recoveries are that weak, so long will you get the rise of politicians who will be mandated to uh, prioritise domestic interests over all other interests. And so, you know, I think that's going to be a real worry in the year ahead. Deborah. You're on mute, Deborah. We can't hear you, Deborah. I have to apologize and uh, say I, 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 and I wanted to leave with a, with a positive note on one topic. And the one topic I think is uh, with uh, the old discussion that we have, uh, and uh, particularly going back to what Anna was saying at uh, the very beginning in terms of inequality, it's, uh, it's true that in Central Eastern Europe uh, we see some of the region uh, that are struggling the most at the European level, also looking at uh, the digital and, and uh, green transition uh, that uh, they will have uh, to face. It's also true that uh, digital and green can be an opportunity because uh, there are a lot of jobs uh, to be created created out of uh, the green economy and that uh, there are jobs uh, that are uh, through reskilling on the digital side, the digital companies are those uh, creating more jobs. So the green, green and digital transition uh, can really be an opportunity. And, and, and with that, I have to apologize. <laughs> you, you see, I know that you have to leave and you see that the crisis is going to be a catalyst, a beneficial catalyst for more green and digital jobs? I, I hope so, and I think so, in the sense that uh, I think that at a certain point, uh, not uh, too soon, uh, but at a certain point, uh, the policy response has uh, to become uh, more tied uh, on uh, facilitating this transition. And uh, I think uh, that, uh, that uh, this uh, would be something quite important. That, thank you very much for that, Deborah, because that's the answer to the last question I'm going to ask everybody that's your answer to it um because i want each person i would like somebody to say if we're going to have fiscal okay. union across the rhine thank you deborah ciao see you next year Bye. <laughs> um i would like somebody to say if we're going to have fiscal union across the rhine um, but the question i want each of you to answer before we unfortunately have to close is what is the most positive result of the covid19 pandemic and why don't we start with you Yes, and I thank you, Christopher. And I want to say, as co-author of the Green New Deal, that I share Deborah's uh, optimism about the way in which uh, the Green European Green Deal uh, can move us out of uh, depression, can move us out of a slump. Um, and I am very excited about the Green Deal. Um, I hope it won't be blocked by uh, by fossil fuel lobbies and so on. But that is a positive way. I, and I, uh, as, as someone who drafted a plan for um, recovery based on tackling climate breakdown, 
Uh, I think we've got to look at that. But my concern is, will politicians prioritize that over domestic concerns and domestic protectionism and, if you like, rising nationalism? That's something. And I agree uh, with, I think it was Peter talking about the forthcoming uh, uh, election uh, to replace uh, Angela Merkel. That's going to be really important. Are we going to get a more protectionist leader in Germany that does not want fiscal union? Or are we going to get someone that is open to the need for fiscal union? Because I think it's absolutely urgent. You, and you just very implicitly put fiscal union and protectionism as though they were opposite sides of the coin, which I think is a little bit unfair potentially to people on either side of the argument. But um, Peter, What's the one, Gilles? Gilles, sorry, you have to leave quite quickly too. So, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, excuse, excuse Gilles, me. What's, I, uh, uh, what's the most positive thing to come out of this crisis? Actually, this is precisely what we're discussing. You know, all the taboos that were broken were given up in in no time because of because of COVID. And I would link actually uh, the progress we made in Europe on fiscal union and debt neutralization with COVID. Without it, it would not have happened. And one of the reasons I'm remaining quite relaxed, even if uh, Mr. Mertz uh, become uh, the next uh, head of CDU and maybe the next chancellor, uh, is because I think that in the case of Germany, whoever is the leader in the end, the need to continue to support the European construction is overarching. So I would say whatever the candidates to the leadership say right now, in the end, the gravitational force, if you want, of Europe will make the next leader of Europe, uh, will force him or her uh, to, to continue uh, uh, creating, creating more ties. It can take more time, but it will happen. You, you may have just made a Freudian slip by describing the next leader of Germany as the next leader of Europe, which is an odd thing for a Frenchman to say. <laughs> but nonetheless, we, I thought it was worth pointing out that you had said that. Um, Peter, single most positive results of this crisis. First of all, the acceleration of the digital transformation is visible in uh, almost every part of uh, the economies uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19. And additionally, the optimization of the production uh, through better diversification of uh, the supply chains, they could lead to higher productivity and long-term growth outlook. Uh, therefore, I'm optimistic and to summarize, the structural changes therefore get a boost um, and um, that means also we have a request for more sustainability. Um, the orientation towards sustainability will bring us new business opportunities with more stable and longer lasting returns into also the sea region and that means we start a new business cycle in 2021 with more rapid technological changes leading to a higher duration of the upswing. That's my um, my judgment on this. That all sounds very welcome. A diversification of supply chains is certainly an incredibly important, potentially beneficial phenomenon for CEE as people decide that for whatever reason, they would prefer not to have all their stuff from China. And Azad, last to you, the most positive result of all of this crisis we've been living through. Is it digital jobs, green jobs? Is it diversification of supply chains? Is it fiscal union? I think it, it's uh, all of these things and potentially uh, much more. But the big one for me is the fallback of uh, the rise of populism uh, that we had seen in the, in the last sort of 10 years. And what we've seen uh, in opinion polls over the last six to nine months or so is that in uh, people now want to see competent um uh, centrist governments uh continue to run uh their countries um, and so i'm hoping that in the next set of big elections that trend will continue and we will have uh less uncertainty uh, and less volatility as a result so we finish on a note about elections i, I know in, in the end everything is political uh, and of course, all politics is local. That's another uh, wise word that uh, I forget who said that. Somebody who knew what he was talking about. Um, thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And Peter and Azad are still with us. Gilles and Deborah, who have who've gone off to do other things. Um, and thank you, everybody out there in the world, watching us, listening to us. Um, we hope very much that a year from now, you can join us in 
physical, real Vienna. 